Welcome, Burrito. Welcome. Can you hear well? Is audio okay? Roxy, Hello. Well, welcome, Robert. Were you able to, to find your your cell? Recover? No. Oh my. Just a, just a few more minutes and we wait until everyone starts to come in, join us. In the meantime, if you have anyone that you can invite, just invite them, send them a message. It started. I'm doing that too in here. Invite, invite them to, to, to share. Please don't post the reminder not to post the URL meetings, the, the meetings, the, um, the URLs, the links for the direct connection where we are now. Otherwise, we get um, security problems. Otherwise, the other, the other links are okay. I'll put them in the, in the chat box. So something like this is fine. And <clears throat> Diana, Diana should be here pretty shortly. We um <coughs> We just spoke not longer long not long ago. Otherwise it's going the usual crazy with the elections in here and uh, what's got, what's being posted on the uh, social media and whatnot. Oh my, oh my, oh my. But this is this is it. This is what we need to do. It's um a COP twenty seven. It's um a lot of talk, no action. A lot of blah 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 blah. Let's see if we can get some action going on in here. So we have a great cast. Let me, uh, by the way, um, yeah, he's online right now. Hold on. Got some more in here. Diana is here. Hi, Diana. Hi. Hi. And our guest should be here momentarily. 
So there with us. In the meantime, I send a few more messages for people to join in. Invite you to do the same as well. Last minute. Everything looks okay. The technology is working. Don is here. Welcome, Don. Welcome, welcome. This this is the eco sustainable family. All over the world. And uh, I'm just checking the people still trying to log in, trying to come in. Let's last minute reminders. Thanks everyone for being with us this Saturday. We are already on four years before COVID. Yeah, yeah. It was before COVID that we went online because we couldn't do it face to face. But anyway, we couldn't do it face to face anyway, because um, it goes all over the world. It, it's everywhere, all over the country, all over the world. But I've um, done this quite a few times quite a few times, face to face, conferences, workshops. People still trying to log in. Don, if you can hear us, just uh, let's see if Don is here. Yeah, Don is here. You will have to unmute your microphone uh, if you want to say something. You will have to move the mouse to the bottom of the screen. There are two or four. Oh, yeah. Okay, you found it. Okay, hi. Otherwise, just going to put a quick slide. A, um, Showing mm. something, just an introduction, and then I'm still waiting for a few few more to join us. Okay, he said they they would be here. All right, please prepare your slides if you have them already open. I'll show you how to get them on the screen. Very easy. Yeah, I'll queue them up and then you have a share screen kind of feature. So we'll honor the um, ancestors and the Tongva Nation on ceded land. I now stand. It's my home, their home. When, while we do that, Still trying to get some more people in here. Some more messages coming in. Or not person trying to get in. See if I can help him. Okay, and these guys should be showing. There's a connection in here, connection problem. I have about six screens in front of me. <laughs> so, 
and the electronics. Um, so all this stuff has to go through a mixer and then it goes out, gets in, gets out, otherwise it doesn't work. Some software packages have that, but I, I don't have them, so they, they are um, behind paywalls and whatnot, and it gets a lot, a lot more complicated than it needs to be, in my opinion. So this works well. It's, it's on Facebook Live. If anyone has a problem uh, that, or it doesn't want to be there, let me know and I'll cut it off. So that won't, won't be a podcast. But otherwise, Facebook Live has started. Uh, we have had uh, quite a bit of... Um, Attendance, and that is okay. There he is. Welcome, Abdul. We were, we're waiting for you. That's uh, thanks for joining us. And we have a few more people that should be here. Let me see if they um, send them a last minute. Okay, this one also said he was going to be here. Who else? Quite a few. Good evening, Mr. Tony. Welcome, Abdul. Where Where are you? I forgot where you are. I'm Senegal. I'm from Senegal. Senegal. Senegal is yeah. right next to Cameroon? No, no, no. Senegal is right next to Mauritania. Oh, on the on the on the on the east coast, on the Indian Ocean. West coast. West West Coast, West Coast of Africa. West Coast, Senegal. It's northern part or southern part? Western part. Western part to the north to Nigeria. No, no, no. Senegal is closer to Guinea Bissau. Oh, Guinea Bissau. Guinea yeah, yeah. That, now I know where it is. Right there, where it uh, it make Africa almost, makes almost ninety degrees in there. It goes, it goes inside, and then it goes down uh, yeah. Guinea Bissau. It goes down to Angola, Congo, Angola. Angola. Yeah, yeah. Namibia, and we had we had people, we had folks coming in from um, Namibia, from um, okay. Kenya, from um, Malawi, from um, um, Tanzania, quite South Africa, okay. quite 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 a few wow. already, and uh, no. we need more. Join the eco sustainable family. See if we can do something together. It makes sense. Because politicians aren't, yeah. aren't, aren't doing it. <laughs> As usual. For <laughs> hundreds of yeah. years, been just messing up. So, yeah. we are about just about to start. There's one or two other people that, a few others that said they wanted to be here, and I'm sending them messages typing in here as furiously as I can but it's already uh, okay. one more minute and we get started no problem sir anyone that wants to say hi please do in the next minute okay. Loxy is in Madrid um, Diana is in the UK I'm on the west coast. Um, Robert is in on the east coast, almost in New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Please uh, turn off the radio.
And uh, we gave um, the slides on the screen is to honor the ancestors that have been on this land way, 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 way longer. Some people are already claiming they have been here for 100,000 years. So we are recent arrivals and I am on the Tongva, which is now has goes by the name Los Angeles. And that's that's the Tongva nation. California, m many of you may not know, California was uh, was home for 300 nations before the arrival of the Europeans, the white Europeans that came in the last 500 years. 300 nations in California alone. The United, what's now called the United Nations, the United uh, United States, is as 574, the last I count, nations that have been recognized by the government in um, in Washington. So we honor them. Thank you for keeping the land that is now our our home too. And I'm um, going to take that. Let's see if the technology last call. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Uh, we're very honored to have Don here today. He is going to make a presentation on being in place. What is being in place and why we should be in place. And he's going to talk about organic farming and uh, collecting water which is one uh, from the rain rain harvesting also called rain harvesting or harvesting rain uh, which is um, in our view is the first thing to do and that's something that especially here, here where I am in California we are in an enormous drought it's going on for almost 20 years right now and our reservoirs are below 20 percent on average and they're not not getting any better we had some rain in the last week a little bit a few sprinkles early in the week and um, but it's it's not enough and uh, besides that we're we're doing we're doing nothing 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 absolutely nothing to collect harvest that water other than what nature does for us and which is not sufficient we should be um, and uh, and in addition the um, our infrastructure is not built to do that uh, what used to be um, chaparral and uh, wild sage and oaks from uh, including um, uh, the, the flat leaf uh, redwoods of a uh, subtropical forest that extended from uh, all the ones that know California extended from meat uh, mid distance halfway between San Francisco in the north and Los Angeles a place called Big Sur used to go all the way to Canada and over British Columbia redwoods and uh, beaver that was coming all the way from Alaska what is now called Canada British Columbia then the state of Washington, the state of Oregon, all of California, over the board of Mexico into the state of Sonora and uh, what's now today the name of a, of a dog that, that grows in that, that lives in those areas, the very small dog called the Chihuahua. Beaver used to go all of that range well over maybe about 2,000 miles, we used to have beaver just 500 years ago. It's come, may come as a surprise to many, to many, to almost all of, 
all of us, comes a surprise. There used to be beaver right here, right here where cities like go by the names of San Francisco or Los Angeles or, or Portland, Oregon or Washington, uh, Seattle, and all the way to Tijuana and, uh, and uh, the state of Sonora, Baja California, he used to have beaver. Beaver used to be here. So it's all gone. It's all gone. So without, without further ado, I'll, uh, Don, if you're ready. Uh, reader, yeah, yeah, all kinds, of, all kinds of willow. Any, uh, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of trees, especially the ones that have um, soft bark. They, um, uh, there's someone I, uh, I know in <laughs> Santa Barbara, and uh, I'll. Um, I've been trying to invite one of the um, persons in in that group, and we sh we shall have we shall have a um, a presentation uh, a presentation soon. Beavers are the engineers of nature, it's no, and they, they're great water collectors. There are there are more than evidence that shows that when the beaver comes in. Uh, the, the 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 landscape changes changes dramatically uh these 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 those changes in science they are called trophic cascades it's it's not the show today it's not the session today but we'll come back to that uh and many other things that may makes begins to construct and put together the puzzle of our existence here on earth and the puzzle that makes sense. It's not just one thing, it's not just agriculture or, or energy or housing or education. It's all of it. It's all of it. And the parts that of, of that group of things that make sense, that that supports life instead of destroying it, which seems to be for the last five hundred years seems to be what we are, have all been engaged to in doing. So that has to stop. So Don, welcome everybody. Don, the floor is yours. Please, please uh, click on the um, square at the, the bottom of the screen that, that with a arrow hop. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. It will have three choices in there and select okay. window. Then okay. when you look at that one, it should show the window that has your presentation open. Okay. Can you see um, it? Click on that. Yeah. One. Click on that one. Yeah. Then share at the bottom lights up. Click on share and we should start seeing it in here. Everything goes well. You are on okay. a very good c connection. You come loud and clear. Is the audio and voice good for everybody? Say yay, say nay. Good to you. Oh, yeah. Good, good, okay. good. And we're we're seeing you. Uh, yeah, it's right here. Now, if okay. you could put it in 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 um, a slide mode. In are you? Okay. This is an apple. Yeah, uh, I, I think I just did in the slideshow. In the that's it right there. In a, yeah. In in uh, it should be in um, what's the name of that thing? Just a second. It should be in yeah slideshow, because then okay. you are full yeah, or full screen. Yeah. Because then the okay. central, but it's uh, okay. We can the the letters are big enough and we can see it. Is everybody seeing it? Okay. This is it full screen right now. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I have two slideshows queued up. One is on larger permaculture patterns, and then I have another one um, just on water. Uh, so how much time do we have now? On this segment, I, we have... Maybe only have time. 
on this segment we have uh, 35 minutes and then on the second segment we have another hour so that you you can you you can show the first slide show this um, 35 minutes and then the fourth the next one you could show the second or the remainder of this one depends how it goes and then have a little bit of time for a little bit of time for a question and answer and also at the end of this one in here we should have a few minutes of question and answer how does that sound okay sounds good so i'll, I'll go through this one and how about 25 or 30 minutes and then leave a little bit of time for questions and then we'll do the more practical uh you know one on water systems after that so um thanks for the opportunity uh my name is don tipping and i live in southern oregon i'm about uh, 65 miles or about 80 kilometers from the ocean in uh, a mountainous area called the siskiyou mountains and we're in between the Cascade, volcanoes, and the coast. And I've been here for over 25 years now, where I've been farming. And the I grow a wide diversity of crops with my family and some employees on about 10 acres. So about four hectares, for those of you who use that orientation. And uh, our primary economic outlet is a seed company called Siskiyou Seeds I've been doing for the past 12 years and we grow and steward about 700 varieties of open pollinated certified organic vegetables flowers and herbs and we work with we grow about half of the seeds ourselves at our home farm and then we work with a network of growers throughout uh, our region the Pacific Northwest because with cross-pollination and seeds, it's not possible to grow them all at one location. So I've been farming for about 30 years and, um, you know, our farm, in addition to seeds, we do a wide diversity of fruit trees and berries and other medicinal herbs. And we sell at a farmer's market uh, once a week and, um, and are moving into producing more value-added products from the land, uh, like apple cider vinegar, hard cider, fire cider, um, different things with chilies that we dry, dried fruit, this type of thing. Um, so where I wanted to start, and I think it's somewhat pertinent because we just had an election here in the United States, and a lot of people pin their hopes that we can do this sort of top-down outside in type of change structurally and from a permaculture lens and I've been a student of permaculture for 30 years or so we go from patterns to details so we start with a nucleus and then radiate outwards from there you know and that has to do with your personal morals and values and I think this is summed up well uh, by Buckminster Fuller who was an inventor and thinker in the U.S. Uh, he was born in 1895, died in the 1980s. And he, in 1927, said that politics and education have little to offer in terms of actually developing solutions. And I, the older I get, the more I tend to agree. Not that we shouldn't vote, but that if we can't cohere in our own lives, our own community, uh, you know, peaceful, regenerative systems, then it's unlikely we're going to be able to do it from the top down. Or if we do it from the top down, it will most likely be through dictatorships and um, a strong arm technique. So I put together this little sequence of slides just to get in that type of thinking. So to me, I think being a person of place means being relevant within the circle of life so seeing you know in permaculture we say the problem is a solution so if humans are the problem then perhaps humanity us all working and thinking together as humans but also with the whole circle of all the other many millions of species would be the solution so you know zooming way out we're in a galaxy of a hundred billion stars it's estimated and we're just around one of them and 
if you were to put this in context in this image here, you can see that small red circle. That's all the stars you can see on the darkest night in the darkest place. If you're changing so even if you're slides, in the middle of the ocean, you can only... If you change slides, we are not we are still yeah. on the first one. Oh really? Okay, gosh. Um you may have to click on the left side. Click on the left side where the slides are showing. Okay. Um now the, so on the left side is... they are not showing. We only see the eye. Oh okay. you bring back the slides on the left. Please. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm trying to do that. I'm 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 used to presenting with um using a screen share on Zoom and this one is behaving differently to me for me. So you should be able um, to advance or press the right arrow key on the keyboard. Yeah, that's what I did. So now are you see back to the first slide? We only and see now, the first slide. We are are you the, seeing the, a picture of a galaxy? Still on the first slide. Okay, perhaps I'm going to stop sharing and try again because it's it's not working like mm. on my end. Though. Can you bring can you show again the 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 slides on the left? It's called the navigator. Okay, so can you How about Are you still just seeing the eye? Number 1. Okay. Yes. Gosh. Um Well, um you're presenting to everyone. I, I don't understand how to. Yeah, it's on it's, my yeah, uh, end of Stop here, sharing. Uh, you can stop sharing and, and restart again. Are you seeing it, the slides move now? Not yet. Still the okay, eye. Okay, yeah, I think I have to stop and start over. Um, stop presenting. And I shouldn't do my entire screen. I should do from a window. Mm, yes, that's exactly right. Should do a okay. window that shows on the choice. So clicking, you say you have three choices. Select window. Okay, okay. Now we okay. see the galaxy. Okay, great. Okay, so you know within the. Sorry about that technical stuff. No problem. Stuff all these platforms and things to figure out um in the darkest area of the milky you know looking at the night sky we can only see about four thousand stars so you know i think that's you know where we you know in permaculture you start small and you harvest small mistakes so you know as as the thinker jordan peterson says learn to clean your room and if you can't keep your own room clean then you have no business telling anyone else what to do and i tend to agree if you look within the Milky Way, this is about where we're located, you know, and we're just one star in one galaxy out of trillions of galaxies. And, you know, in, in an immeasurable diversity of, of structures within the cosmos. And so here's a relative scale of the Earth. We're about 93 million miles away from the sun. It's still not which advancing the slide. If you click on the left side on the slide that you want, Let's see if we see it. There you are. So um, use that method. Click on the on the slide to change. We're seeing the, the death. yes, we see Jupiter Saturn. The, now we see okay. the sun. All right. Jupiter so, Saturn. Okay. I guess we'll just go with this. Um the the light from the sun takes about seven minutes to get to the Earth. It and to put this in relative scale. Uh, and this image is the Earth and the Moon on either sides. And we're so far from the Moon that all the other planets would fit neatly within the two. So just to give an idea of the, the relative scale of space. And when we hear talk of going to Mars, it's absolutely absurd. It takes six months to get to Mars, given our current propulsion technologies. And that's only when Mars is conjunct with the Earth. When it's on the other side of the Sun, it would take two and a half years. So if you run out of oxygen or water or batteries or what have you, it's it 
it's just lunacy to think that we're going to be able to pull that off without a massive technological breakthrough or many of them. So I think it's always valuable to gather the scale of the circumstances of what we're in. And I think there's a lot of uh, modern narratives through the internet that are proliferated that are just completely inaccurate that, you know, for instance, that consumer behavior will change these larger dynamics as we're on a planet in a cosmos next to a star. And again, you have to cohere a nucleus around your home. So, you know, when we think of life began as a point, so these are, you know, single cellular org organisms and they began to organize a community in the early kind of protoplasmic phase of earth. And when we think of, we talk a lot, hear a lot about the six mass extinction wave. Well, when oxygen first came onto the earth plane in high concentrations, when chlorophyll containing chloroplasts began emitting oxygen, we, it led to the die off of over 99% of the life on the planet. So as much as it's sad to see these large charismatic animals, going extinct in our lifetime it in the grand scheme of the circle of life it is uh actually fairly minor in terms of total numbers of species so you know we started from single cellular uh organisms that you'd call prokaryotes and here you can see some viruses and other things like that that's a spirochete in the middle 8% of the human DNA is actually from viral origin because those are ancestors. We evolved from things like this. And then things began to be more uh, complex, protozoa. And basically, you know, as, as life moved from RK to the protista, it branched into the basically the ancestors of the plants and the ancestors of the animals. And through that, more and more pathways develop. These are neurons. And as life complexified, it began to have more different expressions and interactions. So here you can see chloroplasts in a leaf. So that was, you know, a major turning point in the evolution of life on this planet because life began to interact with the sun as an energy source. And before that, it was, uh, that was, you know, the sun was just to provide enough warmth for metabolic processes to occur. Here's another image of chloroplasts. Um, and then, you know, when we look at basically the diversity of life and how recent um, these higher life forms that most of us recognize as life is, it's all basically within the last billion years of our four and a half billion year old Earth. And, you know, the, the larger things like look at flowers and bees didn't come along until about 120 million years ago. So, uh, you know, a lot of the reality that we're concerned with uh, has to do with basically the last few seconds of the evolution of the earth. And I think that's important to understand. Here's looking at the major, you know, categories of life and the bacteria and the archaea basically are invisible to us and yet support the vast majority of the eukarya, the eukaryotes, the, you know, multicellular organisms that have a nucleus. Um, is what we see as life. Here's another way to view that, and basically the branches of the tree of life. And, you know, we have the, the, the kingdoms of life, the plants, the animals, the fungi, and the protista, and the bacteria. And again, we are just the last, you know, most recent uh, iteration of many um, recursive iterations of how life organizes. Here's another way, you know, as humans began to understand this, you can see how recent the uh, viewing, we, most schools still teach about the five kingdoms, but you can see back in the early 19th century, we just saw it as two kingdoms, plants and animals. And then eventually by the 1860s, we began to see that fungi were not plants. So we had three kingdoms. In the 1959, we had four kingdoms, plantae, fungi, animalia, and protista. Then eventually we added the monera to describe the bacteria and the viruses. And now, uh, you know, we've differentiated further, further with archaea and monera, and that is only within the last 30 years. So I think it's important to understand as people make these very profound uh, assertions that we 
can only really describe that which we know about. So as the um, astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson said once, science is really good at explaining things we know. It's lousy at explaining the anomalies. And there's a lot we don't know. Here's another way to look at this. Um, I won't dive too deep into it, but we're discovering new things all the time. So another view that's pretty amazing to me is that uh, you can see these circles describe the relative uh, richness of species diversity of these various categories of beings that we share the planet with. The insects represent an estimated 1 million to 5 million species of which we've only categorized 20%. The arachnids, we only know about 17%. Whereas the mammals, because they tend to be larger, we've accounted for about 98%, but there's still ones out there we don't know. Here's another way of looking at just total diversity of species. Uh, another way, you know, the insects and the arachnids are uh, represent the vast majority of biomass on the planet. Um, another way to view this is if the entire history of the earth were one day, one 24 hour cycle, humans would have appeared about one minute to midnight. Uh, so again, the impact we've had is huge and perhaps we can begin having a positive impact. Uh, because, but however, things take time on earth, you know, and this erosion in a um, plateau in Brazil is a, a depiction of that, how, you know, things, it, it's this recursive iterative process of many, many cycles occurring over a great span of time. And that's what's resulted in everything that we see, including ourselves, whether it's baobabs or leopards, you know, snails, uh, you know, the mollusks, uh, and the, the complex, uh, neural evolution of, of octopus, uh, you know, the, the reptiles that we've shared, the various uh, sense perceptions, you know, whales, and it, all of these different forms that occur in nature that as we begin to look around, we see there are certain um, almost like rhythms or melodies that uh, repeat through time, you know, so like in this image here in the African savanna, that's an acacia and an elephant eating an, uh, an acacia branch. And the acacias in the Fabaceae family, they're nitrogen fixing plants. So they have an important role of cycling uh, nutrients through the ecosystem by taking atmospheric nitrogen and making it available in the soil to enrich the soil and ensure the fertility of things. And to put this in context is that since the, basically the late 1800s, humans have doubled the amount of nitrogen applied to the earth's surface. The other half that nature has provided, and humans are nature, but before humans developed the Harbor Bosch process for using natural gas to convert, um, nat uh, you know, basically the air into anhydrous ammonia fertilizer, the the other three sources are animal manures, nitrogen fixing plants, and lightning. So humans have doubled the amount of nitrogen. So now we're running into some planetary boundaries because as natural gas becomes more scarce and more expensive, it's not as readily available for fertilizer production. So it's really important that we go back to regenerative agriculture techniques of nitrogen fixing plants and animal manures for compost to enrich the soil to grow our food and restore ecosystems. And that way we are weaving ourselves back into this tapestry of life. You know, the things depicted in this image of a North American indigenous mother and her child, you know, and using animal skins and appropriate technologies to live in harmony with the earth. And a lot of our technologies now are degrading the resource, whereas uh, traditional ecological knowledge Either, either lived in symbiosis or actually increase the capacity and diversity and productivity of the earth. Uh, this image here is of uh, Mexican women using a barrel cactus to card wool that's been dyed with cochineal, which is a, a species of insect called a scale that grows on prickly pear. It produces these brilliant pink, red, and purple dyes. That's appropriate technology there.
uh, as are, you know, these, these other, um, you know, medical technologies, medical qigong, understanding inner cultivation so that our medical system needs to be, you know, more oriented like this around enriching health and balance and harmony rather than correcting problems once they have already happened. And that's part of because we've been turning the natural capital of the earth into profit. And that profit has externalities, whereas, you know, indigenous peoples over the land, they understood that their life only existed in balance with all the other forms of life seen and unseen. So here's an image from our farm. There's a, a cat. We have seven cats here. They're an important part of the appropriate technology to catch gophers, mice, uh, uh, other rodents uh, like rats that would eat our food and our seeds. And so they're part of the system. This is my friend Corbin Harney. He was a Western Shoshone elder and he did a ritual every morning. He was their spiritual leader down in the Nevada area and he would welcome in the sun and the birds and the rain, everything in creation. And he saw his role for his people as that they had to do that or those things would go away. And I think because we've forgotten a lot of these things, we're, it's going away. And you can see in this little cartoon, you know, pretty much biology was eat, survive, reproduce. And now humans, we are wondering what it's about. And uh, you can see that that unclarity is having problems. And this is another way to look at that is, you know, humans, we see the world off most of us from this anthropocentric humans at the center or the top of the whole thing. Whereas a biocentric worldview recognizes that we are just one of many species and um, that we rely on the interconnectivity of all these things. You know, so here I like maps like this. You see no political boundaries, just ecological gradients. And this is where we live, you know, or, or if you live on another part of the planet, it looks in its own way similar to this, how it's mountains and fields and deserts and forests. Um, and, you know, we share this landscape. Where I live, we call the Cascadia bioregion. And so this is, you know, parts of Northern California up into Alaska and extending into Idaho. And these are all the major rivers that flow into the rivers that flow to the Pacific. To the south of us is Sierra, uh, the Sierra ecosystem. Uh, and to the east would be, you know, the great Mississippi ecosystems. So I think as we begin to understand uh, where we live from a more bioregional perspective, it helps us to become people of place. Uh, but uh, sadly, a lot of us have to correct the types of thinking that is, uh, you know, humorously depicted here in this television set that is being fed uh, BS, you know, bullshit from, uh, you know, oftentimes our own naivete. And I really like, this is one of my favorite quotes from co-founder of Permaculture, Bill Mollison, and I'll read it. And I have really devoted my life to this. And the more I think about it, it just becomes more and more important with every passing year. There is one and only one solution, and we have almost no time to try it. We must turn all our resources to repairing the natural world and train all our young people to help. They want to. They need to. We need to give them this last chance to create forests, soils, clean waters, clean energies, secure communities, stable regions, and to know how to do it from hands-on experience. And why I think this is so important is so many people are caught up in all of these nonsense things, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's professional sports or celebrity culture or uh, NFTs or cryptocurrencies or all these kind of things that are just distractions from the basic uh, mechanisms and, and tools and technologies and wisdom of how to live in balance on this planet, which we know humans are able to do because we wouldn't have got this far um, if, you know, we, we didn't know how to do that. And another way of looking at this is that we have the, um, if we're going to have the wisdom and tool or, or the, wisdom and tools of gods which we do with our technology and then we need to exercise the compassion of gods and we haven't quite learned how to do that yet and the giant messes humans are making is 
beginning to show more and more. So this is another way to look at that kind of bioregional paradigm or the industrial scientific paradigm. I won't go through it because it's probably self-evident, but it's much more about symbiosis and less about polarization. Uh, and, you know, this, this red pill, blue pill is, it's a hard pill to swallow, but if we aren't the ones to do like what Bill Mollison was urging us to do starting back in the, the 70s, then uh, we're going to live in a more nightmarish reality. And the, why I love working with seeds is because it is intrinsically obvious. So you can see all these children with their hand in this, this bowl of corn seeds. Everyone gets that seeds are pure potential. It's hope because in and of themselves, they're tiny. There's not much there. You could eat it, but then it would go away. Whereas if you plant it, it multiplies uh, enormously, sometimes a hundred thousand fold or a million fold. And so that's why seed is such a poetic metaphor, whether it's used in poetry or music or uh, these various descriptions. Uh, here in this picture is Teosente. So this is the ancestor of corn. Uh, the Latin name is Zia Mexicana. So humans interacting with the potential of seeds uh, turn this into you know, the corn that we know nowadays. It's beautiful and productive and so nourishing of so many um, empires. And we could say the same about wheat or rice or quinoa, depending where on the planet that you are. And you can see from that Teosinte that our indigenous ancestors turned it in all these different forms, uh, maize, as we most people call it on the planet, or maize. And one of my uh, mentors, Gary Nabhan, who's a ethnobotanist in Arizona, has claimed that 99% of the improvement on our food crops was completed 300 years ago. And that was completed by our indigenous ancestors, wherever in the world you are. And our modern science has added less than 1% to the, uh, you know, what we have as food today. And yet they take all the credit when the reality was it was the indigenous seed keepers for millennia that brought us all the foods and medicines and other useful plants that we enjoy today. And so you can see how nowadays these small, uh, you know, just for the U.S., but I imagine it's this way and most of the earth, we've concentrated humanities into these urban centers that have no idea about food, where it comes from, where these things evolved, and how to interact with them in a way that renews them. And uh, yet it's the light, uh, you know, purple, where all the food is grown, or uh, the wild creatures live. Um, I'll just skip past that one, kind of silly. And you can do this on any scale, you know, so here's a man in, uh, in Manhattan, and just has a little balcony, and he's doing his part to grow food. Here's uh, Ron Finley, who he went from a career and the as a, a professional American football player, to he is the uh, what they, what's called the gangster gardener. And he says, growing your own food is like printing your own money. And so he's showing people how you can do this. Here's a uh, rooftop beekeeping in Europe. Uh, here's a, a large urban rooftop farm in China. Here is someone in Eastern Europe who's turned a bicycle into a farm tool. Here is a friend of mine in Corvallis, Oregon. There his, his suburban yard has become a permaculture food forest. And, you know, with World War II, we had the Victory Gardens, and these will be the real superheroes, is the people that figure out how to revitalize our food production. I like this one here. It says permaculture is revolution disguised as gardening. Because if you have your own food, the danger of falling food doesn't need to be cargo ships delivering, uh, you know, packages to starving people, but it can be that food is falling from the sky from trees. Alan Chadwick is one of the godfathers of the um, intensive gardening movement. He, his mother was a student of Rudolf Steiner. He says, there is one rule in the garden that is above all others. You must give to nature more than you take. Obey it, and the earth will provide you in glorious abundance. And I really like that one that keeps us in that uh, the spirit of reciprocity. Um, so I'll stop there and leave a little bit of time for questions. 
And as you wish, as you wish, Don, uh, if you like to continue to the end of this these slides, we still have seven minutes, and then we'll uh, I'll make a note of the questions and that are on the chat box, and as as you wish. Okay, or I can just jump into my next one. Uh, which is a little bit more about my work here. Are you on my are farm. you are you at the end of the the first series? Uh, yes, correct. Okay, then uh, the microphone is open. Questions, otherwise, uh, Robert, just go ahead and um, unmute your microphone. And on the chat box, we have six minutes. Diana says, excellent presentation done. She's enjoying it. Diana is in the UK. And Robert also says, nice work with the indigenous plants in improvements. Totally concur uh, with all of these uh, great presentations. Great presentation done. Um, CISQ, one of, one of the things that we'd like to speak about is the, the focus. Uh, focus number one is that what we're doing right now, education. Focus number two is to create a uh, free and open university of eco-sustainability. We have medicine, we have literature, we have arts, we have music, we have engineering, we have rockets like you were talking about, the insanity of going to Mars. We need something sane, which is uh, learn, study, understand eco-sustainability on the planet because that's what we have within light, many, many, many <laughs> light mm -hmm. years away. And the third focus is to create, myself included, um, areas of eco-sustainability. So that to bring resilience, to bring support, to bring uh, community, to bring um, the yeah, political power and uh, and on and on and on so societal power science power bring all of those things together and begin those areas around the world and we brought already quite a few examples in here where that is happening and that's the reason we, we are here try to and we'll have more in the future uh, next month i alert i will alert you but at the end of the month, beginning in December, there will be uh, some significant voices that have been working for decades on that, on those same issues as we are right now. So more questions on the chat box. The floor is open. How oh, from Diana? Would you like Don, to? Can I get slide nineteen back up for a minute? Yeah, uh, let me just take me a moment here. And then sure. Diana has a question. And we still have five minutes, a little bit less, four. And um, I think Don's going to, I think Don said till, um, um, thank you very much, Don, by the way. I think uh, you'll cover the climate bit um, next session, I think he said. So I'm looking forward to that. Oh, okay. Okay, here's that one slide. I, I zoomed over. I, I teach at universities too, and I love diving into, um, you know, understanding the evolution of how life got to where we are. I think that's a, we a have really to. Important. We have to totally concur, hundred percent, hundred percent. So, no, no escaping on the on that one. If we do, we do it yeah. at our own risk. <laughs> yeah. That's um, so there's that. okay. The slide is here. That is number 19. That's what yeah. you, you were saying, Robert. Okay, any, any other questions? We have uh, three minutes, two minutes. That's... Um, Otherwise, the, the the slides are magnificent. Thanks, Don. The very 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 good. Well, yeah, good progression, good cover of pretty much fundamental issues, fund fundamental points that are uh, necessary that are needed to know as uh, as we go along in 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 the path that we are in. 
look, look a good mile posts of um, our road. Two minutes. The link for the second hour is was on the screen. I already mentioned that one time. I'm going to put that again. Please copy and paste this link on the ne for the next hour. Same process as getting in here. And uh, if anyone runs into a problem, just either um, DM me, send me a direct message or an email, and I'll I'll get you out. I'll get you in. Any other questions? The um, yeah, it's, this this is what you presented in here is really conversation for hours and hours. That's that's a lot of um, the seeds, of course. The the seeds that you are producing are yeah. heirloom, heirloom, that right? And you you do everything. Uh, most are heirlooms. Uh, it, heirloom is Ten not a, a concrete uh, description. It, it basically represents you know varieties that were five seconds. See you cultivation. soon. Cultivation. See you soon. <clears throat> Welcome back, Don. Welcome back, Rita. Everybody looks uh, everybody looking good on this beautiful, beautiful afternoon in Southern California, SoCal. Welcome, Rita. Rita is in uh, Galveston, Texas. Can you hear as well? You can hear as well, Rita. And we're still waiting for the others. Now the, um, these sessions get uh, the outreach. It's difficult to um, with the metrics that these platforms give. It's not easy to. Um, they're not very comprehensive. But it seems to be low. The minimum minimum is 100 to 100 folks, and the highest is, we just had one one session about Cuba and agroecology in Cuba. There was more than 2,000 people. So that looked at the podcast, and I, it's not always possible to know how much they see it and and to what extent. But uh, trying to um, get these, we've been doing this for three years, pretty much every, uh, we may have missed one or two Saturdays, if that much, in, in three years, going for the fourth year now already. So two hours on Saturdays, same time, same spot. Welcome, Diana, welcome back. Hi. It's great work done, great work. Uh, you were you were speaking about heirlooms. Yeah, basically, it's it's a hard uh, thing to uh, you know pin down because basically all our seeds are open pollinated, meaning they're not hybrids, uh, okay. and you can save seed from them. And maybe about half are traditional heirlooms, meaning they're older varieties. But like I'm a plant breeder as well, so if I'm breeding a new variety one of the words that we use to describe some of that kind of work in the seed community is the heirlooms of tomorrow. And uh, so heirloom is a good thing, but it's not the, uh, you know, it, 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 as accurate as a description as uh, open pollinated, I think is uh, uh, the best uh, approach. So. And open pollinated, does that, uh, so the hybrids do not breed true, that, you can, that right? You can, 
Well, you can save seed from hybrids, but they, usually you get what's called genetic disintegration right. uh, after growing at one or two cycles, and it's no longer as good as the parents. Whereas an open pollinated variety is stable, so it could be handed down, you know, generation after generation, and still uh, retain all of the beneficial qualities, which is really important for climate resilience. And I think that you know, plant breeding and maintaining diverse open pollinated varieties is going to be a really important uh, element of, of a resilient agriculture moving forward. Mm -hmm. So like for instance, in uh, India before the green revolution, there were over 30,000 varieties of rice and they may seem like an absurd amount, but you can imagine for generations, farmers just saved their own seed and planted their own seed wherever they might be. And those varieties would become adapted to those climates in the monsoons and the pests and disease there. And then after the Green Revolution, uh, which there was, you know, people got Nobel Prizes for the Green Revolution. That's right. And, That's and right. The guy in Texas forgot to his name. Yeah. Immense uh, you know, reduction in agrobiodiversity. So in India now, there's only about eight varieties of rice that are commonly planted. So we went from 30,000 to eight, you know, and that's a really extreme example, but we've seen uh, a, a similar, you know, kind of monocrop mentality um, persist. And that's because, you know, somebody's trying to make money off of it rather than feed people nowadays. And I think we should be more concerned about feeding people than profit with agriculture so that's um, a great um yeah that's that's a great point exactly exactly thanks. right it's uh there's another word for that it's insanity <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> madness yeah. absolutely yeah has been, has been I mean, okay roxy is in here roxy is in madrid they are We've been uh, trying to get some uh, folks from the, from the Spain as well, um, and from Portugal, and we had people from Europe earlier as well talking on these issues. Um, I personally have been to quite a few of those spots in Europe where these and gave lectures and gave um, presentations and workshops many, many, many places in Europe that um, people are are debating these issues and are putting them to work as well, especially in northern parts of Italy, southern parts of France, uh, northern parts of, uh, of uh, India, Asturias in Spain, south of Portugal, center of Portugal, in, uh, in England, the UK, one, one of the, the earliest, uh, that was the... Um, what's the name? Starts with an F, Fel Falkenberg, uh, F uh, forgot, can't remember right now, uh, Germany, but especially in the, was imp very impressive in the northern part of Italy, close to Austria and Switzerland, it's called the Trento, Trenti Trentino and Tuscany, and in the south, in Sicily, farmers uh, were, because of the European regulations, they were given money, so drop your heirlooms, uh, drop your open pollinated uh, crops and get this money and start these fast growing and and high production varieties and the farmer said uh-huh okay and uh, give us the money and they kept the money and kept growing the old varieties <laughs> which they call mm -hmm. they call the uh, granny antiki so the translates from the the latin is the the um, antique grains or the old grains the ancient grains or heirloom grains um, Sicily is really, really a, a paradise of biology, fauna, and flora. Um, they have some um, 60 varieties of, of wines that we've never, and grapes, of course, that we've never seen them here. They have several uh, the, the animals, uh, goats, and and uh, um, donkeys and 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 uh, other birds, uh, domesticated and non-domesticated birds, uh, some um, 68 or 69 varieties of wheat. We've never seen them in here. That's what they call the Granny Antiki, and and the bread is absolutely delicious, especially when when it's um, 
um, um, fired in a uh, brick and wood uh, oven. So, without further ado, everyone in here, welcome. And Don, please do continue. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll go ahead and get up this next slideshow here. And um, the farm where I am now, I've been here for 22 years. And when we moved here, we knew we were in a area that suffered droughts. Uh, people that aren't from Oregon or don't have much experience here can just imagine Oregon as uh, all forest and it rains all the time. But the truth of the matter is, is that in the western part of the state, we are a winter rainforest or a temperate rainforest. We get anywhere from 30 to, you know, 200 inches of rain a year, um, whatever that is in centimeters. I'm not as conversant, but a lot of 30, rain. Uh, 30, similar 30, is about, 30 is about 700 millimeters and two... Okay is is about 2000 that's about uh, 10, geez now my my brain my brain froze i'll give you the answer okay thank you for helping with that um yeah but in the summer it it's not uncommon for all of western oregon and definitely eastern oregon to get no rain from june 1st through the end of september so four months of desert uh, you know, so our rivers and streams may still be flowing, but the land is drying out. So contrast this to the American Southwest that gets monsoon rains in the summer. So the corn, bean, squash, milpa culture of you know, New Mexico, or Arizona benefited from monsoon rains, whereas where we are, it there, the rain just stops. So we may get an occasional thunderstorm, but it's by no means enough to grow crops. So designing around water is paramount. And this landscape used to have abundant beavers, like was being discussed earlier, and old growth forest. And those two in conjunction, the old growth forest pulled the moisture in off the Pacific Ocean. And then the beavers slowed the movement of the water from the mountains down to the valleys down by creating, you know, earthworks and uh, beaver dams and ponds throughout the ecosystem. So then the land would get the rain when it happened and then soak it in like a sponge. And as my friend Brock Dolman says that our, our approach with water should be to slow it, spread it and soak it. So, Obviously, I don't need to tell any of you that water is essential to life. Inside every cell of every living thing is water. So whereas we are composed volume-wise, humans, about 60% water, because water is made of hydrogen and oxygen, and hydrogen is the smallest atom, by molecular count, like in just pure atoms, we're 99.9% .9 water. And water, it's the great limiting factor of the productivity of a species, of an ecosystem, uh, or a, a region. And, you know, water, Buckminster Fuller talked about in a book I just finished reading from the 1960s that's called From Oblivion to Oasis, that he predicted that China and India would become the great superpowers of the planet because they both... Uh, have the watersheds that flow off of the Himalayas in the Tibetan plateau. And it is somewhat interesting to see that that pattern seems to be emerging. And I would not be at all surprised within the next decade or a few that we see China and India as the great global superpowers because of their water resources. And this water courses through the land in all these different ways, but fresh water is a very limited resource on this planet and humans are drawn to it in all the ways that it shows up and it becomes the lifeblood of the landscape and and the oceans as well and this is uh, one of the things I do as a bit of a hobby as I harvest seaweed and uh, sea kayak so this is here at the Pacific Coast in the kelp forest um, 
that, that same image that Svenny was in the other slideshow. It's just a very striking image of water erosion. And, you know, water can not only be a blessing to the land, it can also be harmful, as we see with flooding. So maintaining that balance of vegetation with water flow is crucial because the vegetation helps slow down and capture not only the benefit of water, but also its force. And here we can see at an estuary environment, all of the sediments that wash off the land and then create these rich uh, kelp forests or uh, coral reefs. And then we can see in desert landscapes too, how water serves to erode, but also transport that those minerals that you know pulverize rock downstream in different ways and enrich the land and most agriculture on the planet it's believed developed out of what's called flood retreat farming you know so we can imagine the fertile crescent whether it's the tigris or the euphrates or the nile or the any of the monsoons and the rainy season would flood and then all of this nutrient rich silt would be deposited in the the you know the the flood plains along these rivers along with tubers, roots, rhizome, seeds that were transported from up high down. So you can imagine how onions are very much like this, or garlic. They're in the Amaryllidaceae family, the lily family, and grow from a bulb. So in those that, you know, where floodwaters retreated, then people would go out and gather all of the abundant annual or biennial veg vegetation that uh, occurred there. And that very likely is one of the foundational elements of how agriculture occurred. And you can imagine how cereal grains would grow richly on these floodplains uh, once the floodwaters retreated. And that's a, a really interesting point to ponder. Water has also been a source of great um, struggle. This is Mono Lake a bit south of me in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Mono Lake used to be about 100 feet deeper, and it was the second most important migratory uh, flyway stopover point for migratory birds moving from Mesoamerica up into, you know, United States and Canada. And uh, people t in developing Southern California to take water from Mono Lake to transport for agriculture and development further south. And that led to the level water level in Mono Lake going down very a lot. So these structures you see here, these are, it's called tufa. And basically it is calcium carbonate minerals that bubble up from the bottom of the lake from natural springs, because you can see the high snowy mountains in the distance. Uh, and form these structures underwater. But then with the lake level going down, they become visible. So it's become a spot tourist go, but it's really a sad testament to the poor water management in California that has occurred for the last century and continues to this day. Here is a glacier uh, coming out of the uh, British Columbian Rockies and glaciers you know, is another form of water that's grinding up rocks and making uh, soil, mi mineral rich soil. So if you look at the Corn Belt in the United States and many of the fertile areas around the world where people farm today, it's the result of glaciers that moved soil and created mineral rich soil. In Kauai, I covered this in my last slideshow, but again, just understanding, I think everyone should have a bioregional understanding for the patterns of water uh, in, in the landscape of where you live and what would the native vegetation be and have, you know, again, back to that biocentric worldview. Um, here's a, a beautiful depiction of, uh, this is where I really, now we're getting down to brass tacks here uh, of, a farming system that I came across in the early 90s called the Key Line uh, Approach. And this was developed in Australia by PA Humans in the 1950s after destructive cattle ranching happened on desert landscapes. So this is just one image of a uh, 700 hectare ranch where 
many dozens of ponds were built. And so this is a landscape that gets about 10 inches of rain a year. So um, you can imagine that's, let's see, 2.54, you know, about 250 millimeters of rain a year. And so fairly dry land and they capture that water and then release it through a series of gravity fed ponds and ditches. So I've patterned my farm off of this key line design and I think it has a lot of value uh, for helping to restore desertified landscapes. And, and, and basically what we're doing is we're mimicking the action of the beavers and the old growth forests. And you do this kind of work in conjunction with tree planting and increasing habitat for other species that will help the cascade of biodiversity to in increase. Here's another way that people have done this. This is in North Africa, and this is called waffle gardening. So you can see in the bottom of the image how they just, they raise up these little indentations that allow water to be concentrated where they're growing the crops. So it's a way to, um, efficiently use scarce water resources. So there's many of these tools and strategies that we can employ. Uh, so you can imagine how like the previous image was large ponds. This is like many tiny ponds. Um, and I know this has been in use around Israel and different areas of the Middle East for centuries as well. And the uh, indigenous peoples of the desert Southwest did a similar approach of how do you concentrate water to make the most beneficial use of it and keep it from running off the landscape. This is a, sorry, it's a bit blurry, but I think it's how we should begin to view the, the landscape. This is mostly the United States looking at watersheds and knowing your watershed and what watershed are you in? Where does it start? Where does it go into the ocean? Uh, you can see over on the one side of the image, that big light blue, image that's the san francisco bay sacramento river watershed the yellow over on the other side is the mississippi river and understanding like we call it thinking like a river or thinking like a watershed is really important and i, I would love to see political boundaries dissolve in my lifetime and us begin to organize around watershed boundaries and that we cohere not behind a nation state type of approach of identity but more of a watershed approach because that's how the rest of the species all interact with the landscape here's another way to look at um, this watershed approach of the lens of the united states and i imagine people have done similar work uh, of, of understanding you know what are the primary watersheds as uh, contrasted against the uh, the state or nation national boundaries, which are oftentimes arbitrary and don't observe any physiographic uh, features of the landscape. And to me, that's part of ecological literacy. This is one of my sons. He's now 20 years old and taller than me and his friend, you know, out learning about the rain firsthand, learning about the ecology uh, firsthand and Here's an image of my farm from, this is probably about 20 years ago. So shortly after we built about five ponds on the landscape, we now have nine ponds. And I'll drop a link to an excellent YouTube video that my friend uh, Andrew Millison did about our water systems um, using excellent drone footage and stuff. But you can see how our farming blocks are more curvaceous and we're working with the contours of the land and trying to store water and release it. Uh, an image of the farm nowadays there's 20 years of tree growth so you can't see the curves as well but that's the idea is that eventually we want our farm to disappear into the tapestry of how nature is because that's a good farm or garden is almost indistinguishable from a diverse system so here's you know one part of our watershed locally and i think this is one way you know we can combine our own um you know, recreation or uh, spiritual renewal, uh, however you want to articulate it, with understanding our watershed and going to, uh, you know, places in nature. This is Crater Lake. This is about an hour and a half drive from me, uh, and it is one of the headwaters of the Rogue River. It's an old, collapsed uh, volcano, 
and the caldera filled in with water. It's one of the deepest lakes. I think it is the deepest lake in the United States um, and an incredibly pristine uh, water source. Um, and here's a little bit further down on uh, the Rogue River that flows down through there and the, the actions that water's had on sculpting the land. Here's further down in the canyon and we regularly every spring go for a hike along the Rogue River Canyon and understand more deeply the, the landscape that we share uh, this with. And I think that helps us be better land stewards. Uh, here's that Rogue River. And again, back to that first slideshow, and you can see so many of these patterns, uh, these spiral patterns in water and, 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 and that can help inspire us of how we design landscapes. Here's a mountain lake that we go camping at. It's another one of the sources of the watershed, you know, so there, here's the snow and rain that accumulates in these lakes and then trickles down through creeks and rivers. So we regularly go on hikes and, you know, pilgrimages up to the snow and the springs to, to be connected to the water where we live. Uh, here's looking from one of our orchards up at the mountain that we're, our farm is on. And that's the name of our farm is Seven Seeds Farm because there's an old landslide that looks a lot like a seven. That's all old growth forest up there. So that that's not uh, the result of logging. That's just uh, how it formed. So, you know, we're blessed to have a clean watershed above us. And, you know, if we can take care of it and keep it from being logged and polluted, it will, you know, continue to provide clean, abundant water for future generations. Here's a, a good Google Earth image. You can see at the top of the slide that, that image of the seven and my farm kind of down in there. Uh, this yellow boundary is our local watershed. We have a year round creek that flows through the farm. So we've looked at like, well, where, where does that creek start and understand, um, you know, what we're working with and, uh, and the potential total flow too for if there were a flood to understand like, oh, this little creek that flows through our farm actually drains a few hundred acres. So, uh, you know, we need to be mindful of that uh, in, in terms of our design so that we don't do things that become a problem for future land stewards. And so I do a little bit of this work uh, with permaculture design and I'm learning new mapping tools to be able to help people understand this because I think having the context of where you are in your greater watershed because each you know large river watershed is comprised of smaller sub basins and so for us the work we do we built nine ponds here so we're helping to accentuate the sponge and water harvesting capacity of our local watershed and hopefully having a positive impact so even though we're using water we are uh, allowing the excess water to be slow down and infiltrate in while we build organic matter through woody vegetation, perennial, uh, you know, useful plants on the landscape. So these, you know, modern tools that we have help us to uh, get a bird's eye view and see what we can do. Another way we can get that bird's eye view is go hiking. So this is a hillside near where I live and you, it's difficult to pick out, but that you can see some of them are greenhouses there in the center of the picture. And we can look down and see how our farm is surrounded by a sea of forest. So for an animal like a bird or any other animal, that's how, when they come to our farm fields, that's the uh, context within which we live. Here's a more recent aerial picture. Uh, you can see some of the tree growth has, um, you know, increased. Since then, this picture actually, even though I said recent, it's eight years old. So there's some new ponds that aren't pictured here uh, since we built that, but you can see it's uh, more green. It's probably taken at a more, this is in July. So even though in July for us, it can be up about, you know, over a hundred degrees or, you know, like 35 degrees centigrade it could be quite hot because of all of our uh, water catchment and disbursement and distribution networks, we're able to keep about 10 acres that we farm, which about four hectares uh, green the entire season and produce uh, a wide diversity of, of useful plants. Um, 
this where our water source is a year-round creek so you can see in this image a two inch black plastic pipe so we have a gravity flow water system so we are taking water out of the creek about 30 meters above where our farm is so we have gravity pressure and that's a really ideal system so we don't need electricity to have pressurized water to run drip irrigation sprinklers or fill ponds or flood irrigate uh, here's another picture of that pipe going into this pool i create a simple rock dam um, to just keep that pool as deep as possible and i actually just went up the other day and took my little rock wall down so that as our winter rains happen uh, we don't um, get you know that damaged um, and then this is the creek as it goes down through the forest uh, through our farm this is just right above where our farm fields are and then we have you know hiking and maintenance trails up there to just be familiar with our water source because it's uh, it is the lifeblood of what we do um, and this image on the left shows you know how much water can come down through that stream and then the image on the right is looking at you know after we get these floods there's medicinal herbs this is a ginseng species called california spikenard that grows in the stream channels so just understanding all the dynamics of these uh, ecosystems that we're working with um my boys this is a picture from quite a number of years ago uh we built a, a couple little bridges and we developed a figure eight hiking and running trail across uh, our year-round creek and we have a couple seasonal creeks so it makes it easy to get up and check out what's happening uh, and just observe and learn from our our environment um, and you know taking dogs for walks is a key part of that uh, exercise uh, here's another view from this hillside looking down at our farm. This is probably springtime because it looks like the uh, hardwood trees haven't quite leafed out yet uh, and, and just see how we're nestled in this forest. I'll pause here for a little bit. This is an image from uh, the university, uh, Oregon State University up in Corvallis did a project about our farm. So looking at you know how do all these ponds work with swales and other key line canals and again i'll drop a, a video link in the comments there um so that you could if you're curious about learning more about this but depending on our soil type it makes more sense to have swales which are dead level uh, and are quite easy to construct either with hand tools tractor or bulldozer or an excavator or a structure we call a key line canal, which has a slight drop horizontally as, uh, you know, so we can move water from one uh, place on the land to another. And again, a lot of these techniques we're using with water are like, we say, playing Aikido with water. So we're, uh, you know, taking a strong, powerful force and we're trying to transform it into connection by instead of the water going from high on the land to low on the land as fast as possible which is basically what water does because that's how gravity works we're trying to get to zigzag down through the land and have as many beneficial interactions as possible um and so here's uh, one of our large ponds this is uh, 17 feet deep so uh, a little bit more than five meters deep uh, and we can store a lot of water there and then we can move that water either through flood irrigation by overflowing it when water is abundant or through um, a pipe a large pipe that's through the dam that's connected to our irrigation system here's another pond a little bit further down and both of these ponds have fish stocked in them and then we are also here doing uh, coppice forestry, uh, willow basketry uh, materials here as one of the th uh, products of our farm. You can see here how we're uh, weaving a wattle fence to keep ducks contained. Uh, we raise ducks and geese for a lot of years while also harvesting basketry material. And we train young people on our farm uh, in all, how to do all these techniques and hopefully they spread that knowledge far and wide so here's that same uh, woven fence uh, with ducks on the other side 
And you can imagine that that wattle fence also is decomposing and feeding invertebrates, insects, mollusks, uh, growing mushrooms, and building soil over time. And we have to replenish it regularly. So it's kind of like doing hugel culture uh, in a little variation. Um, and it keeps us uh, keeps the ducts contained without having to use metal fencing. Um, here's another view of that same pond. And we're uh, cultivating azola, which is a floating uh, nitrogen-fixing water fern that is 45% protein. And uh, if you're interested at all, there's a great uh, wiki page, uh, Wikipedia page called the Azola event. And it describes how about 70 million years ago, atmospheric CO2 levels were five to seven times what they are now. And there was subtropical vegetation growing all the way to the poles cinnamon trees in Antarctica and stuff. And those conditions created an aoxic, of, aoxic event where you had fresh water floating on salt water up in the North Arctic and Azola exploded uh, in its growth and sequestered half of that CO2. So this little plant that is super easy to grow and in warm climates will spread and cover water surfaces and is 45% protein. And pretty much I've seen all animals love eating it and you can make compost out of it is one of the most effective tools we could use to address climate change. And I hear almost nobody talking about it. And not only is it effective, this plant from that Azola event, you know, you can imagine how millions of years ago it grew rapidly and then would die and sink to the bottom of the ocean over and over and over. That became the oil that Royal Dutch Shell and others that exploit oil resources in the North Arctic are drilling today. So it's that literally is carbon sequestration. And so we could be doing that using our uh, you know creativity and our intelligence and our technology to use simple things, simple biological solutions like Azola uh, to help um, balance and stabilize the climate by in growing food. So here, Azola moves from green to red as it reproduces. So you can see, I'll start with a little handful in this enclosure and it'll quickly cover the whole surface of it. And then I'll pull up those, um, there's simple fiberglass floating uh, panels and then the ducks, they'll eat it all. If I didn't enclose it, they would eat every last little bit. They love it. Um, here's ducklings surrounded by Azola eating it. Um, and we also cultivate it in uh, tanks. You can see those black, they're just 50 gallon uh, drums that we cut in half uh, that we're, and, and we'll grow it in greenhouses when it's cold to keep it warm. And baby ducklings or baby chicks or goslings or turkeys or geese will eat it right out of your hand. Um, and the other image too is like another way of interacting with water. You can see how there's a gutter across the sheep barn that then goes into a pipe that overflows that blue tub. So it's a way to take rainwater through gravity and fill a drinking water uh, barrel for sheep. And then that barrel actually overflows into another pipe and there's a big tank on the other side to store even more rainwater. So, you know, again, in permaculture, we say the problem is the solution. So be before I had this gutter system, it got really muddy in front of this barn and the sheep had to you know, walk in mud and their own manure. And this is helping uh, correct that problem while creating clean drinking water for them. Um, here's another view of one of these tanks growing azola and duckweed. And that's called water. Hyacinth is another aquatic plant that we played around with. Not very winter hardy, hard for us to pull off here in Oregon where it gets cold. Uh, and speaking of cold, here's an image of one of our fields in a swale, uh, which is a on contour ditch. So as that snow melts, it's flowing down the land and being captured by this long skinny pond that's perpendicular to the slope. And you can see how it's accumulating there and it's a little warmer microclimate too. So it's melted the snow right there. And then in those enclosures, we have trees growing and now those are big trees uh, and, and, you know, shading over that swale. And then the image on the other side is an irrigation ditch that flows down through our forest. So when we get big rains in the winter, these ditches fill with water and we want to be able to direct them into either swales to store water in the soil 
or into ponds to store it there. Here's another swale. Uh, this is a summer image. So you can see the swale is kind of running diagonally here in the image and ducks are in there probably foraging for slugs and other insects. But when water's abundant, it, it, it slowed down and is able to soak in there. Uh, here's another image of a swale where we built a fence along it and we graze sheep on the lower side. And you can see how they graze right up to the fence. And on the other side, we're growing seed crops. There's corn and some other things over there. And then we have trees planted on there. Um, and in this case, we have black locust and chestnuts and carrageena, which is a nitrogen fixing plant from Russia. Um, here's another image of a swale and you can see how the water is moving in a serpentine fashion through the landscape. Uh, here's a duck pond with willow and this pond actually our gray water systems go into a like bioreactor that overflows into a swale into this pond that then overflows uh, into a zigzagging uh, ditch swale network and you know we're raising livestock and growing woody vegetation there um, and this landscape here has a swale going through it. It's hard to see, but we graze goats and pigs and sheep in this woodland environment. So we're not just using these techniques in our farm environment, but also in a like pine oak savanna. So it's helping the native plants uh, with water um, absorption as well. Um, and using the animals as a tool, this is grazing down some cover crops with our sheep. This is probably late spring like in may and they'll transform that into uh uh you know sheep and wool and all that so here's just another couple of images you know it's like this creek that gets really raging at certain times of the year and then we take that power and we turn it into the diversity and productivity of the plants we grow this is my son jasper a uh, number of years ago with straw flower which is a plant we grow for seed um Here's a field down the road that we farm, again, on the, in the same watershed, uh, growing lettuce seed. You know, so this is uh, being irrigated with drip irrigation, you know, so efficient distribution. Here's another way of interacting with water. This is up at a um, biodynamic farm near us, and these flow forms is a way of emulating the cascading energy of uh, zigzagging water. Um, it's a way to emulate that, to enliven it. Um, and it's something I'm uh, in practice with biodynamics. We don't have a flow form on our farm, but we uh, enliven water to uh, bring that energy to the plants we grow, which are, you know, seeds, as I mentioned before, we have a seed company. And so here we are at a, a, an event, a conference, and you know, we always put out bowls of seeds for kids to run their hands through and just interact with them. And that, that tactile thing that I, I think it's palpable. You can feel the magic that's present in that. Um, and it's all made possible by water. And th so uh, the degree to which we can put water at the top of our priority list and always keep it central to all the work we do with developing land with agriculture or developing resilient communities. So I'll stop there and leave some time for questions. Awesome, I'll... awesome, awesome, awesome. Thanks, Don. This is uh, exactly what we need to do. Thanks for joining us. Everybody should be paying attention, very, very close attention. We've been uh, bringing this message in here for several years now. And uh, it centers on on water, on food, on soil, on plants, on animals, rivers and oceans, because they keep us alive, we don't. It works one way. We don't make air, we don't make water, even if we know the composition, if with the elements would have to come from somewhere. It's basic thermodynamics, which economists don't know nothing about. <laughs> Don't ever consider it, and uh, we bring those those issues to the table. Very few uh, seem to be inclined to do that. They go into theories and um, 
you know, secret recipes and non-secret recipes and pie in the sky and pie on Mars. And um, I would send them all back to school, come back here and learn something. I would fail them all if I could. If I had one power, one pleasure on this planet, that's uh, send, them, send them all back to school from top down, bottom up. So we need, we need to relearn these things. We need to amplify these things. Uh, there will be someone coming in that's involved in an international uh, effort of re-education, including he's, he's already formed his own university. Uh, that's uh, pretty much what I decided to do, uh, being in those areas myself. Um, heavily involved in those areas that soon find out, found out and it's not that difficult to see that the education that we have is going nowhere. Uh, yeah, we can have better cars and better planes and, and uh, trips to, to the moon, but uh, if we destroy the planet that we are in, what's the point? What's the point of those? That's a question everybody should ask. So someone, um, uh, all of us, we're pointing that out, we're pointing that the way. Uh, we're bringing more guests than are uh, walking along this road, wa walking along this path. I, uh, I myself am too, I had to um, kind of, sort of, uh, it's not exactly um, break from the land, but being in the city, it's more more difficult to do all of the things that you were talking about, Don. But I'm looking for land myself, and land near near other um, sustainable neighbors, so we can uh, begin to form sustainable families and sustainable uh, communities, or if you don't like communities, uh, neighborhoods or just woods. We know that John, Mary, um, and uh, Silvio, and uh, Daniel, and Jesse, they all care about these things, so we stop the spread of pesticides, of fossil fuels, of toxics in the water, in the air, of plastics that are now in our blood. Worldwide, they are now can be found microplastics in the, in the placenta of babies. Uh, and, and the placenta of animals uh, worldwide. So this is not an experiment. This is what recently Antonio Guterres at the, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, not assassinating his name, at uh, Columbia University um, just about two winters ago, commencement ceremony of a Forum of Nations they started with those words, quote, humanity is on a suicidal path. Ah, you know, everybody screams. And we should, we should start screaming out of the windows like, like the, the network movie of years. Who was playing that? Jack Lamar, I forgot who was playing there. That, that um, we can't, we can't, there's no solution to that. And those technological techno fixes that are being proposed, you know, more, it's, it's, it's more energy on top of more energy and of existing energy, more infrastructure on top of the same infrastructure, more consumerism on top of the same consumerism. It ain't gonna work, boys and girls. It ain't. And that's the, by ignoring that laws of thermodynamics, laws of conservation of mass, laws of entropy, which are not our laws. They work by themselves. And if we ignore them, the consequences will overcome us. The forces are so big, we don't have remedy to those to global warming and and the climate change that comes as a consequence of acidification of oceans, biodiversity loss. We are already on the, in, the, in the sixth major biodiversity uh, ecological suicide of all times. 
So thanks for coming to, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but it's good to be in church. Uh, maybe we can we can sing together, <laughs> make a better choir. And uh, so um, the floor is open. And any questions? I see quite a few in the chat. Uh, everybody, well, I have one on the Azola. Can a flock of ducks leave just on the Azola, and no no need for further care? They just take care of themselves, eat Azola. And at the end, when uh, someone wants roasted duck, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was the question. I don't know if you got that question, uh, Don. Okay, I am. I, I was just typing it in the the I, oh. about the Azola. I'm glad somebody put the Azola event. We used to sell that and duckweed on the website. Um, However, we just had problems with it. It doesn't ship very well because it has to be kept in water. Um, and so some folks, it just didn't didn't arrive in a good condition. So we, we stopped selling that. So I would imagine that, like, it, you know, if you look around or ask around farms and ranches that people would know about it. Um, and, and that, you know, perhaps you could get some, you know, like you just scoop it out of there. A, a pond or something, you know. I, I give it away to anyone who wants it here, uh, but I, that's that's limited. Can a uh, but can, plant? Can the chicken will feed on them for sure? They probably will go crazy. Oh yeah, they go crazy on yeah. that. And uh, can they? Uh, and, uh, is there something as a, a a Zola diet, or do chicken or ducks need something else? You know, I think it, I, 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 not being a, a poultry nutritionist, I don't know for certain, but um, okay. they're pretty happy with it. You know, like we cut back uh, a lot of, uh, you know, the supplemental feed, the grain that we would feed them uh, a lot. So okay. I just put two YouTube videos in the, the chat, and those are the ones I was referring to that one is a real great overview on uh, our water systems okay. and the other what it's more about the seed and plant systems but they're very well produced and the man that makes them he works for the university here has a bunch of other international uh, focused permaculture videos i highly recommend okay those two links on the uh, and uh, on the on the chat box and again i'll uh, if i sometimes i kind of s skip it uh, lack of time but usually I copy it on time and uh, send it, put it in the mail. Everybody have the mail from, I send it to to them and more and, and more people so they also can catch on the on the podcast. And the another, Rita says, uh, says, thank you very much. And also that in the city, we don't follow those watershed um, stories and narratives and, and discussions because we just ignore it. And that's what happens. It rains in the city, it goes to a second sewer, it's shipped directly into the ocean, no treatment, it doesn't go out to, through any treatment. Um, some cities in the, around the, the bays and of Los Angeles started flash flood treatments, but it's very narrow and, and, and the water is not collected, it's not slow down and soaked in like, like what you were referring to uh, earlier. None of that exists. Even in some restorations that are being planned and then already in very small scale, one mile here and there on the 50 miles of what used to be the LA River, uh, it was a floodplain. All of that has disappeared uh, by far and uh, with large has, has gone. That, that, that's, uh, again, part of the insanity, part of this infrastructure that we built over centuries, over millennia and centuries in this country, that is nonsensical, um, is disconnected from nature, is disconnected from ourselves, is disconnected from the universe. So we need to find that center again. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, the infrastructure that is being planned, still, again, it still makes no sense at all. Uh, there is no watershed in them. It's 
that is a a a an urgency to get to get rid of those things you know to get to get rid of, of the water as fast as possible as soon as possible because it's a nuisance it's not something that is part of 60 uh, 65 60 70 percent of our body but it's something to get rid of us so that's the extent of our madness as human beings and our disconnect and our ignorance that ultimately could be our our fall and it looks that way so as antonio guterres put we are on a path that is suicidal uh, we need to stop there and bring those voices in in please do continue we're in the last five and seven minutes uh someone has Rita says a lot of information to take in and um, Diana would like to have Azola seeds. Where can she find them? Do you ship to the to the yeah, UK? Uh, I you just have to look at local. I would look at a uh, like pond supply store. Uh -huh. um, would be your best bet. Um, yeah, and just a, a word of warning: some some folks that are concerned about invasive species are, are concerned about them, but. They're already in all our watersheds out here. Um, so, um, okay. Yeah. I, I would just ask around locally. Okay. Uh, and hopefully somebody can get it to you. Roxy, go ahead, please. Azola in Spanish is what, Tony? You, you're also looking for seeds, uh, if, if I understood you well, Roxy. So what um, Don says is to look into something called a um, pond store in uh, in town. Most likely they. It's the second. Yeah, yeah. There, It's it's fairly widespread. Like throughout Southeast Asia, it's it's very common in. Um, you know the rice paddies so that in, in the world of organic rice cultivation people know about azola okay and uh, last uh, again again please uh, roxy how many uh, percentage of proteins have got azola 45 it's more than beef. Beef yeah. has uh, at most 20 and 20 cents, depends on where it comes from and what kind of cattle, what kind of animal it comes from, 20, maybe a little bit. So it's quite a lot more than, than beef. And it's vegetable, easily assimilable. It doesn't come, as, uh, it doesn't come associated with other animal toxins. Um, uh, can it be used in, on the salad, like the small leaves? You know, I've never tried eating it. Uh, I, I can't say. That is okay. a good question. I'll have to try. Okay. A friend of mine was doing, actually did, completed a PhD in architecture at UCLA. Uh -huh. And uh, actually what he was doing, it was covering the top of buildings with shallow ponds that and uh, as with the zola on it and measuring the, the the daily growth and how much would that impact into the building temperature in order to maintain temperature stability in the building it's a little bit complicated maybe there are i think there are easier ways of doing that but um that's uh, that's what he did and finished his um his doctorate at, in architecture not a lot of people go for a doctorate in architecture. <laughs> if I would say I would add to that. Not that many that, that venture in, in those waters. Um, for for obvious reasons, it's it's extenuating. Um, some Robert it was was mentioning in Mono Lake. Um, was uh looks like a sci-fi the landscape 
but I believe se several movies have been made there uh, in, in uh, related to sci-fi. And yeah. And there, there is one. Uh, it was Mono Lake in part, not 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 hundred percent, not totally, but was in part by replacing the water toilets in LA. There was a a subsidized campaign that uh, yeah, actually I did that too at the, the, at the time several some time ago already, so more than more, more than more than a decade that uh, you would take your my own um, toilet to a, a collection place and they immediately give me a not a not a fancy model a modest model but the tank was much much smaller instead of being um at the time i think it was like five gallons of water per flush they were cutting it down to one one point six. I think now it's about one point two gallons. It's a little bit over four liters, from up from um, uh, twenty fifteen twenty twenty some twenty some liters. So quite a substantial, and that in part saved Mono Lake from actually drying up. Uh -huh. the, Diana says that her, the her chickens are really eating up. Those uh, varieties, clover, uh, clovers, clover, dandelion, golden rod, and uh, she also Diana also plant, uh, plant, planted a lot of amaranth uh, and uh, winter peas. So they seem to be. Are they happy, uh, Diana? Sorry, I think it was. I think it was Robert who. Uh, 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 Planted those the chickens actually. I I, I brought one up minute. the subject of one um, of uh, um, eating weeds. Uh, kind of like it's become a bit of a pet thing for me. Really, just eating eating plants that just grow really easily. Great and amongst to the have you here uh, today. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for all of you. Thank you for being such a gracious uh, guest, Don. We'll stay in touch. Yeah, sure. We will we'll work with you. Hope we 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 will work with us. See you next week again. Bye for now. And for everyone on mine on Facebook, this is uh, this is it for today, boys and girls. Uh, thank you, everybody, to joining us. And please invite others. Please share. We have great guests coming in. Uh, all of this is uh, volunteer, and it's around the world. It's happening around the clock. I hope to see you uh, see you all uh, next week again, and we will announce it soon to, through the usual means. Uh, um, appreciate it that you also uh, collaborate in alerting others, sharing with others, and if you need the the links to 
be on directly on the on the video and ask questions directly to the to the guests to the session session guests uh, mail me or email me or send me a direct message have a great have a great week have a great uh, weekend and bye 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 for now